Mark 6, 1 through 13, the key components of Jesus' message. During my lifetime, there have been evangelistic efforts aimed at proclaiming the good news of Jesus. The goal has often been good, but the method, not so much. For instance, I recently heard Franklin Graham give a quick gospel presentation on the radio, which ended with, pray this prayer with me. The problem with this is that the Bible doesn't put the focus on praying a prayer, but on faith in Jesus. Sadly, such presentations give the idea that repeating the words of a prayer will somehow make that person right with God. Another group has started a television radio campaign called He Gets Us, which gives the idea that Jesus was once considered a rebel. In their commercials, they give the idea that because Jesus was considered a rebel, he understands what we are currently going through. Is this what the Bible teaches? Such presentations are trendy ways of presenting a somewhat Christian message, but they actually distort who Jesus was and what he did in an effort to get people's attention. That's not a good thing. Now, if these popular evangelistic ideas are not good, where can we find the truth? The Bible always has the answers to our questions. And in today's passage, we will see the two key components to Jesus' gospel message according to the Bible. The key components are faith and repentance. As we read this portion of the Gospel of Mark, consider what Jesus says about both faith and repentance, and then consider how you should respond. And if you are a Christian, consider how you can accurately and biblically present the good news of Jesus the way that the Bible does. First, let's look at the need for faith. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. So the need for faith. What does it say? After being with Jairus and his family, Jesus chose to return to Nazareth, the place where he had grown up. This was about 20 miles southwest of Capernaum. His disciples also went with him. What must his friends have thought as they saw their former neighbor arriving with twelve disciples? On the Sabbath day, Jewish believers met at the synagogue to be taught. Apparently, the inhabitants of Nazareth hadn't flocked around Jesus as they had at Capernaum. But Jesus still took the opportunity to teach those who did come. But note that it says he began to teach. He started teaching, but the reaction of the audience didn't encourage him to keep on teaching. The people were surprised by his teaching. Some asked where his teaching, wisdom, and power to heal came from. From their perspective, he was just one of them, not a prophet that could preach to them about God and certainly not God's son. So who did he think he was anyway? Wasn't he just a carpenter who was Mary's son? Some think that calling Jesus Mary's son was a subtle jab at him being an illegitimate child. Since when people who were Jewish were usually referred to, they were called, for instance, son of David or son of Jacob or something like that. And when they used the mother's name, it wasn't that she was a widow. It was more an insult that she had had an illegitimate child. And beyond that, wasn't he just one of the people related to Mary's sons and daughters? The people seemed to be asking these questions because they were offended by something he said while he was teaching. You would think that these people would have judged Jesus by the content of his teaching rather than who they remembered him to be. But their response led Jesus to say that a prophet is usually honored except by those who are closest to him. 
In other words, people don't usually respect someone they grew up with, even when he is a prophet. As a result of their response, Jesus' ministry was limited in that area. One commentator said he felt it morally impossible to exercise his power in their behalf in the face of their unbelief. As you may recall, Jesus had just done a great miracle for Jairus' family. He had resurrected their 12-year-old daughter who had died. But he was unable to do a great miracle there except for healing a few sick people. Their lack of belief was astonishing to Jesus. It had happened earlier in Gadara, but this was on the Jewish side of the country. Why did they not believe? Because of their response, it's probable that he never did go back to Nazareth. And these hard-hearted people missed out on what Jesus had to offer. But he still set up a circuit of places to teach in the surrounding villages. Now, what does it mean? This passage teaches us that without faith, people will not receive Jesus. Jesus taught God's truth with great wisdom and later verified his message by performing some miracles. But without faith, they were offended at his teaching. They were content to ignore what he said because they were familiar with his family. I wonder if Jesus spoke about their need for repentance. The fact that they were offended by him indicated indicates that they not only didn't believe him, but didn't think he had any standing to tell them what to do. All of this would have changed if they began with faith. They would have believed him and listened to what he taught. They would have believed him and praised God that one of their own was being used by God so mightily. They would have believed him and honored him as God's servant. They would have believed him and seen more evidence of God's power through miracles that he would have done. But sadly, none of that happened because they did not believe. Now, how does it apply? As you consider the unbelieving response of these offended neighbors, there are two applications. The first involves your own unbelief. If you have heard the messages from the first chapters of Mark, you are well aware of who Jesus is and what he has done. He is God who became a man. He proved that by his words and his miracles. He taught the truth as only God could, and he cast out demons, healed the sick, and raised the dead with the power only God has. But has knowledge caused you to believe him, or are you continuing in your unbelief? God wants you to respond to all that Jesus is and what he has done with faith. The second application involves a Christian's response to the unbelief of others. When we were still unbelievers, we were blind and didn't understand the truth. But there came a day when God opened our eyes and caused us to see the truth about Jesus. That was a wonderful day. He gave us the faith to believe, otherwise we never would have responded. Now as believers, we must be patient and work with unbelievers. We may be astonished at their unbelief as Jesus was, but we must continue to teach and preach the truth so that unbelievers will become believers. Remember. Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We should follow the example of Jesus, who marveled at their unbelief, but then kept teaching in the surrounding villages. When one person responds poorly to the truth about Jesus, it is sad. But not all will respond that way. When the person at one door rejects you, go to the next, and keep your faith in the power of God to use the Bible to convince others of the truth. As you preach the gospel to others, have faith in God's ability to open the eyes of those who are blind and to grant them the faith to believe. The second section is Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13, and I'll read those. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place, and whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. 
Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Our first section was the need for faith. The second section is the need for repentance. Now, what does it say? Jesus summoned the 12 disciples and then sent them out in pairs. He gave them power over demons. Uh, this power, them able to cast out demons, would authenticate their preaching. Just as the miracles performed in the book of Acts confirmed the gospel preached by the early Christians. All they were to take with them was a staff and a pair of sandals. They were not to take a bag, bread, money, or extra clothes. Note that Jesus' unusual instructions pertain just to what he was giving them on that day. There were other times where they could take money with them and things like that, but in this time he was trying to teach them to trust God to provide for their needs. This makes me think of what Jesus said at another time. Matthew six thirty three and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. As the disciples traveled from place to place, they were to stay in the same house they were offered until they moved on to another place. Apparently at that time it was uh, a practice and even a duty to offer hospitality to strangers when they arrived in a village. So it was probable that some kind-hearted people would offer these preachers a place to stay while they were in town. And if someone was unwilling to receive or listen to them, they were to shake off the dust from their feet in their presence. This was a way of showing that they wanted nothing to do with even the dirt associated with such ungodly rebellious people. Jesus promised that anyone who rejected them or their message would receive more of God's judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah. Knowing what those cities were like, this was a very serious thing to say. So, when the disciples shook the dust from their sandals, this would give the rejecting people one more opportunity to consider the message they had heard from the disciples. What exactly was the message preached by the disciples? After receiving their instructions, the disciples went out in twos and preached repentance to the people they met. It was probably a good thing to have the disciples in pairs for companionship, encouragement, and effectiveness. But they didn't just preach. They also cast out demons and healed sick people. This must have been an exhilarating time for each of them as God used them to reach more and more people with God's message. Now, what does it mean? This paragraph teaches at least two thoughts. First, there was a great need for the preaching of repentance. This is made clear by the fact that this was the message given to the disciples to preach. If we were to rewind to the first chapter of Mark, we would see that this was God's message given through John the Baptist in Mark 1, 4-5, through Jesus, Mark 1, 14-15, and now through the disciples, Mark 6, 12. This message was so important that Jesus gave the disciples the power to verify their message by casting out demons, doing miracles, and healing the sick. Second, there was no need to worry about their needs when doing God's work. Jesus was teaching the disciples to trust God to meet their needs. As they traveled, God would put it in the heart of some kind-hearted believer to feed, clothe, and house them. But their first thought should not be focused on how their needs would be met, but on the message God had called them to preach. Now, how does it apply? The first application has to do with repentance. That same message needs to be preached today. God's first message is not one of comfort for sinners, but of what their response should be toward God. Do you understand that your sin is a terrible offense to God? Your sins are what keep you from a relationship with God. Your sin has separated you from God. And if you do not turn from your sin to God, you will never have a restored relationship with him. Your sin has to be addressed before anything else. Now let me ask you, have you repented of your sin and turned to God? 
If not, this is the time to respond correctly to God. Think of your sinfulness and understand that God doesn't want you to continue in it. Turn from your sin while God is speaking to your heart. Then and only then will you be ready to take the next step of faith. Now let's conclude. You may have noticed that the main points of this message were familiar terms, faith and repentance. We first looked at the need for faith, for faith, excuse me. Secondly, we looked at the need for repentance. Perhaps it would be best to look at them in reverse order. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a turning away from sin. When you see yourself as a sinner from God's perspective, the only right response is to reject your sin and turn away from it, leave it. This is what God wants you to do, but this is only half of what God requires. After repenting of your sin, God wants you to trust in Jesus. This is what the Bible calls faith. It is a complete trust in who Jesus is. He is God who became a man. And what he has done, he lived a perfect life, died on the cross for your sins, and then rose to life on the third day. And I realize that if you are not familiar with the Bible, these things are not very familiar to you right now because they'll be covered later in this gospel. But I want you to know he did live a perfect life. He did eventually die on the cross for your sins, and he did rise back to life three days after he was killed. And as a result, when you turn from your sins, you have to turn to something else. That something else happens to be Jesus. When you turn to him and put your faith in him, God will forgive your sins, make you a new person, and give you eternal life. This is the message that Jesus preached, and it is still true today. But as you may recall, some people didn't respond with faith and repentance during Jesus' time on earth. Some of his own friends and neighbors were offended by his message and responded with unbelief. Don't follow their example. As God works in your heart, repent of your sin and place your trust and your faith in Jesus. Then join the many others who gratefully call themselves Christians because of what Christ Jesus did for them.